Chapter 3 Graham Like the Cracker Kenny left his bicycle at the foot of Shepherd's Hill near Parish Creek where he waved to old Pop's possum, who was at his usual fishing spot. From there he began hiking to the summit on foot. The weight of his makeshift armor made progress difficult as he worked his way past the oak and maple trees scattered about on the grass-covered hillside. This hill, the largest in the area, had been on his family's property for as long as he could remember. He had collected butterflies and wildflowers here last summer, read the wind in the willows under the large willow tree at the top last fall, and had sled races down the side on the garbage can lid he now held as a shield. It was his prized snow saucer, and it had the scrapes and dents to prove it. Perhaps the dragon would take these marks along with the blackened pots and pans to be victorious badges of previously slain drakes and would be respectful of the little buck. Perhaps the beast would even be a little scared. Kenny made it to the grassy top by sunset. From here he could see the little lamp lights of Round Brook flickering along the horizon. To the west, billowy clouds changed in hue from gold to a fiery orange, then turned red before cooling off into a lovely shade of lavender. As Kenny looked east, he could see the north star, Polaris, twinkling low in the sky. Directly below, curled up and sleeping on the far side of the hill, was the dragon. He gulped. This animal was bigger than the illustrations in his book. Much bigger. Mesmerized, Kenny slowly approached the monster, happy to be downwind of it on the off chance that it could smell him and attack. He was halfway across the hilltop when he thought the creature had sensed him because it was growling in a long, low tone, just like a lion, a giant, reptilian, bloodthirsty lion. Kenny froze, hoping it would stop and go back to sleep. But the beast never moved, and he soon realized it wasn't growling at all. It was purring. The book didn't mention anything about purring, he whispered to himself. He pulled the bestiary out of his book bag and studied the picture once again. The image depicted a dragon that was slithery, scaly, and very fierce looking. Kenny then looked up at the specimen in front of him. It was a bit rounder and hairier and scruffier than what was drawn in the bestiary. Kenny held his breath and strained against the gathering dark to see every little detail of the magnificent monster dozing in the twilight. He didn't dare make any noise, even though he was dying to light his lantern for a better view. After a while, the rhythmic purring started to make him feel relaxed. He listened while its large ribs expanded and contracted with each breath. He closed the book and put it into his satchel. At this moment, the great beast cracked open one large lemon yellow eye. Kenny froze, mouth agape. The creature's head rose up from the ground and focused on the small rabbit studying him. Then the dragon did a sort of a fake stretch and a pretend yawn and settled back down. Of course, you know this move very well. It's the, I'm pretending to fall asleep, but I am really wide awake move, and is best used on parents when they check on you in your bed at night. The dragon closed his eye, gave out a sigh, then said in a low, growly voice, no throwing rocks at me or poking me with a stick or yelling at me, cause I won't tolerate it. And don't waste your time pouring water on me to douse my fire, cause that doesn't work at all. I just got comfy on a nice, cool spot of grass here, and I'm trying to sleep.
So leave your food and off you go. The dragon's words trailed off and he began fake sleeping again, making a purring sort of snoring sound. Kenny cleared his throat. <clears throat> Nothing. Um, ahem. Still nothing. He had to try another tactic. Were all dragons this unresponsive? No wonder they were practically extinct. Cough, cough. Bantling, aren't you here with an offering? A meal and libation, perhaps? Leave it by my entryway, and then you'd bear to scurry home. It's getting late. I, I, I didn't bring you anything, Kenny stammered. No food, the dragon said, not moving a single scale. Then why on earth have you brought these pots and pans? Surely you were planning on cooking me a delicious dinner. He eyed the garbage can lid shield and serving it on that large metal platter. Not only had his book not mentioned dragons purring, it hadn't mentioned bringing gifts either. Clearly, the author did not take his subject seriously, or else he hadn't done his research thoroughly. Kenny set his broom lance on the ground. Well, I do have a bestiary that I've been reading, but now I'm not so sure of its accuracy. A bestiary? Really? The dragon's eyes opened wide, and he quickly sat up. He rubbed his scaly paws together. Come on, then. Let's have a look. He extended his hand. It was nearly as big as Kenny was and ended in long, sickle-shaped claws. The young rabbit pulled the old book out of his satchel. He grabbed the ribbon bookmark and opened the book to the page titled Dragons. Please don't burn it. I'm borrowing it from a friend of mine. Burn it? What sort of unchancy fire drake do you take me for? Why, I'd just as soon burn my own tail as burn a book. He looked at the title on the cover. The King's Royal Bestiary. Hmm. Let's see here what it says. The dragon stretched out his long curly tail and reached it into an opening hidden in the shadows of the rocks and boulders on the hillside. From there, he pulled out a pair of metal-framed spectacles and set them on the furry bridge of his nose. To the lad, they were the size of dinner plates. Kenny removed the pot from his head and slowly sat down on it. He didn't want to make any quick movements, but he was ready to bolt in case the beast showed any signs of aggression. Wouldn't you just know it? A book arrives and there's nary the light to read it in. Do you mind lighting your lantern? Uh, okay, Kenny said, sure. As he lit the lantern, fireflies began flitting about the top of the hill. They quietly blinked around the monster's giant head, revealing a jagged, toothy grin as he studied the pages. Giving his best performer performance as a relaxed visitor, Kenny sat back down on his pot and plucked a stalk of grass. Casually chewing it, he asked, How long are you here for? It's hard to say. The dragon muttered, flipping through the pages. Hmm. And then he snorted, Rubbish. Well written, but the facts are not at all right. How do you mean? Kenny asked. Look here. It says a dragon's strength is found within its long and dangerous tail. Tying the tail in a knot will render the foul beast harmless, but be warned, all drakes kill anything they catch with their vicious coils. Not true. Do you, little bantling, kill everything you encounter? Why, no, Kenny replied. He was wishing that the pot was on his head after all, and he gripped his garbage can lid shield tightly. Exactly, said the dragon. But I could easily say that the general populace pretty much destroys everything they come in contact with, 
They certainly do when encountering a fellow like me. And I am not killing you at this moment, am I? Kenny thought about this for a bit. Was it some sort of trick? His heart was beating fast, and he was ready to take off, leaving everything behind. His parents, of course, would be quite upset at him for abandoning the cooking pot and lantern up on the hill. Certainly George would be cross as well, and Kenny didn't have the allowance to replace the bestiary he was borrowing. He looked up at the dragon. You're not killing me at this moment, no. Nor do I intend to. The truth of the matter is, is I've never killed a thing in my life, the dragon said, as he closed the book and eyed Kenny. That was the fashion many years ago with the other dragons. They were so earnest, you know, burning down castles, fighting knights, and eating bedizened princesses. That was never my cup of tea. I am more what you'd call a Renaissance fellow. I like to see the world and savor it, not destroy it. So instead of burning down a castle, I would admire its architecture. Instead of fighting a knight, I'd challenge him to a good game of chess. And I'd never eat a princess. Instead, I'd create a wonderful flower arrangement for her to match the silk drapes in her palace, of course. Really? Kenny said. This dragon was certainly not at all what he had expected. Not a scourge, a devil, or even a nuisance. Well, said the dragon with a sigh. That was how I got by, live and let live. Which was all fine and dandy until I got trapped. Kenny sat down his garbage can lid shield and loosened the frying pan tied to his chest. Go on. It took me completely by surprise. You see, I was snoozing under a tree, very much like this willow right here, when the ground literally opened up and swallowed me. A fisher, Kenny said. You must have been in an earthquake. Whoa. He stood up on top of his pot. How did you survive? I drank lava and eight fire stones, which allowed me to breathe fire for the first time ever. Of course, they also gave me horrendous heartburn, which I still have to this day, but that doesn't matter because the lava and fire stones saved my life. They did? Sure, I sat there under the earth and well, actually I caught up on my beauty sleep first. So I slept there under the earth for years and years, but I kept dreaming of life up here. The glorious sunsets, the whispering trees, the birds singing gaily, daffodils, oh, and creme brulee. As he said this, the dragon rose to his full height, causing the swarm of fireflies to swirl and dance around him. As the drake looked up, Kenny followed his gaze to the sky, which was so bright from the Milky Way that he could not tell where the fireflies ended and the stars began. The dragon took in a deep breath, then looked back down at Kenny. And so I finally awoke. With my fiery breath, I blasted and burned a tunnel back up to the surface to see it all again. I mean... How could I miss all of this? That's when I arrived here. What a tale, Kenny said. What do you plan on doing now that you're here? Not much. Enjoy some fresh country air. Eat a good meal. Catch up on my reading. And write some poetry. Actually, I consider myself quite a poet. Would you like to hear some poems? I tried to recite a bit to an older chap who was up here earlier today, but he scurried off. Even after all these years, I suppose I can still have that effect on someone. <laughs> that was my dad, Kenny said. You scared him good. Scared him? Goodness, was my rhyme that bad, the dragon asked. I don't think 
think you understand your situation, Kenny sighed. You're considered a devil and a scourge to society, just like it said in that book. Folks usually want to hunt you down. The dragon put a claw over his mouth and let out a smoky snicker. <laughs> hunt me? For what? Improper etiquette? They are the ones writing horribly inaccurate dragon facts in their books. It should be me who is hunting them down. But you don't. Kenneth! A call rang out from across the pasture from the direction of the farm. That's my mom. I gotta go, or they'll be worried. Besides, I gotta get ready for bed, Kenny said as he grabbed his lantern. Can I get my book back, dragon? Graham, the dragon replied. My name is Graham, just like the cracker, except with an E at the end. And it was great chatting with you. Um, Kenny. Well, Kenneth, but everybody calls me Kenny. Well, Kenny, the dragon said as he handed over the makeshift lance and shield. Do come up again and bring your folks. In fact, let's do dinner tomorrow night. You bring the food, and I'll supply the entertainment. Is your mom a good cook? Tell her I have a ravenous appetite for souffle, glazed carrots, mashed potatoes, and, of course, creme brulee. Oh, okay, I'll ask, Kenny said. And the book? Oh, please let me give it a read tonight. How I love good fiction. With that, Kenny dashed back down the hill and hopped onto his bike. Excited, he pedaled toward his house. He couldn't wait to tell his parents how curious, how interesting the dragon whose name happened to be Graham truly was.